The images you will see in this film were brought back by the Apollo astronauts from their journeys to the moon. Between 1961 and 1972, some 400,000 people worked on NASA's moon landing program. The moon landing remains mankind's greatest technological achievement to this day. This is the story of the daring moon pioneers from Apollo 1 to Apollo 17. The official numbering of the Apollo missions began with Apollo 4, an unmanned launch of the booster rocket in 1967. A year later, the launches of Apollo 5 and Apollo 6 into a low Earth orbit followed. Both were further technical trials of the Apollo hardware. In 1967, a routine exercise led to a deadly mishap on the launching pad in Cape Kennedy. The fatal mission was dubbed Apollo 1 to honor the memory of the three deceased astronauts. Apollo 7 was the first manned Apollo mission. The mission proved the ability of the spacecraft and crew to function well during a longer operation. The main goal was to prove that the command module was able to link up again with the third stage of the rocket in orbit. Docking maneuvers are the most important element of the Apollo program. The Apollo spacecraft consists of two modules and the docked lunar module. The service module. This is where, among other things, the life support systems, the reaction control thrusters, and the main propulsion unit are located. The command module. This is where the astronauts live and navigate the spacecraft. Before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the command module separates from the service module and becomes the landing capsule with a heat shield. The navigation is carried out using a sextant, which focuses on fixed stars. Water particles discharged by the spacecraft's own refuse system make visibility more difficult. The crew soon coins a name for the new star constellation. Constellation Uranon. Space veteran Walter Schirra developed a bad cold on the very first day in space. His experience on the earlier Mercury and Gemini missions was no help. In no time at all, the commander had passed it on to his crew as well. The astronauts have to keep blowing their noses. Under the weightless conditions in space, the orange juice and nasal discharge don't automatically flow downwards when the crew has a cold. Apollo 7 orbited close to the Earth at a distance of about 260 kilometers. The crew had the opportunity to take hundreds of photos of the Earth's thin atmosphere and the Earth's surface. Many of the places they photographed had never had a camera lens focused on them until the Apollo 7 flight in 1968. After 10 days, they had proved beyond doubt that the Apollo hardware was safe enough for the long flight to the moon. Apollo 8 was able to be launched just two months later. Apollo 8 marked the fulfillment of one of mankind's oldest dreams, the first human beings set off to fly to the moon. On December 24, 1968, three days after launching, the Apollo spacecraft braked before swinging into orbit around the moon. While it was behind the moon, the spacecraft rotated on its own axis. As it rose above the moon, the Earth came into the astronauts' field of vision. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? The photo of our blue planet became an iconic picture. For the first time, people became aware of how fragile the Earth is. This portrait of our home planet is regarded as the mainspring of the environmental protection movement. While orbiting the moon, the astronauts read the first lines of the story of creation from the Bible. Their Christmas message was heard by over a billion people. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. 
and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning was the second day. God then let the waters under the heaven be gathered in together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called these seas. God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you. The task of the Apollo 9 crew was to test the lunar module for the first time in the vacuum of space. The petals of the cladding around the third stage of the rocket were blown off, and the lunar module was exposed in the upper section of the third stage of the rocket. The Apollo spacecraft turned through 180 degrees to dock with the lunar module. After docking, the lunar module was extracted from the third stage of the rocket. The astronauts could start to clamber into the docked lunar module. The first solo flight of the lunar module in the vacuum of space after it had been undocked went without a hitch. Secured only by a nylon cable, Russell Schweikert left the lunar module. He took a photo of his colleague, David Scott, who was just opening the hatch of the command module. The astronauts' spacesuits also passed the space test. The goal of Apollo 10 was to test the lunar module in lunar orbit. The astronauts tested all the maneuvers necessary for a landing except for the landing itself. On their flight to the moon, the astronauts had no idea that they would have a brush with death during the mission. The command module approached to within 110 kilometers of the moon's surface. The lunar module had undocked from the command module and swept down towards the Earth's moon. The moon appeared close enough to touch. Only 15 kilometers separated the lunar module from its surface. But disaster struck during the ascent back to the spacecraft. The separation of the descent stage succeeded only after repeated attempts. Then the reaction control engines and the reaction control thrusters failed. Commander Tom Stafford assumed manual control. At the very last moment, they were able to prevent the module from crashing into the moon's surface. An American bald eagle, the symbol of the United States, held an olive branch in its beak, illustrating that the crew of Apollo 11's intention was to land peacefully on the moon. The launch rocket Saturn V was 110 meters high. Here it can be seen leaving the construction hole. The vertical assembly building is over 160 meters high, so high that clouds even formed inside it. A tracked vehicle carried the 300-ton Saturn V to the launching pad some five and a half kilometers away. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. Astronauts report it feels good. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11.
started on July 16, 1969 at 9.32 local time. The start of a Saturn V can be heard further away than any other man-made noise except for that of an atomic bomb. More than 2,000 kilometers away, seismic measuring stations registered the shock waves. The journey to the moon is carried out in several stages by space vehicles, which are jettisoned as soon as they have fulfilled their function. This enables the spacecraft to get by with less starting ballast and fuel. After 12 minutes, the Apollo spacecraft reached its cruising orbit 180 kilometers above the Earth. Following a system check, the go for Translunar Injection Command was issued. After the command, the third stage was reignited, putting the spacecraft into lunar transfer orbit trajectory. The flight to the moon could begin. During Apollo 11's three-day journey, live television pictures were broadcast. The pilot of the lunar module demonstrated how to put ham spread on a slice of bread under weightless conditions. In the command module, the display on the navigation computer shines brightly. There is no keyboard with letters. The astronauts have to enter pairs of commands consisting of a letter-based abbreviation and a number combination. A complete moon mission requires over 10,500 keystrokes. In addition to the sextant and the navigation computer, maps of the stars are also used for orientation in space. They permit the astronauts to determine their position accurately at any time. After a three-day journey of over 380,000 kilometers, Apollo 11 reached its lunar orbit. Neil Armstrong, who was born in 1930 and who was fascinated by flying even as a child, and Buzz Aldrin, son of an army pilot and the same age as Armstrong, prepared to climb into the lunar module. Then, the lunar module, known as Eagle, undocked from the command module. Okay, all flight controllers, go, no, go for power descent. Retro, go. Fido, go. Guidance, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for power descent. Michael Collins remained in the command module and watched his comrades hover away towards the surface of the moon. Soon, the approach towards the Sea of Tranquility would become a balancing act. From time to time, the radio contact between Houston and the lunar module broke down. Completely overloaded, the computer on board the module homed in on a location 4.5 kilometers short of the planned landing area. Commander Neil Armstrong kept his cool and navigated the lunar module using the hand controls, preventing a crash landing in a field covered with scree. The flight controllers at Mission Control in Houston held their breath. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Good. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Michael Collins, still orbiting the moon, reported via radio the fuel level still available for the Eagle to land. With just 20 seconds of fuel in reserve, the lunar module landed on the surface of the moon on July 20th, 1969. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Post control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh... Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Six and a half hours later, Neil Armstrong's words went into the annals of history. Yeah, I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant 
The astronauts documented their two and a half hour extra vehicular activity with photos and 16 millimeter films. Buzz Aldrin carried a scientific platform across the moon's surface and later activated the long-term experiments. One special feature was the stereo camera with which it was possible to take 3D photos of the surface of the moon. The 3D camera made by Eastman Kodak took stereoscopic flash pictures and provided information about the state of the moon's surface and dust from two different perspectives. The shots of the fine lunar sand can only be made on the spot because it would become detached from the lunar rock during the journey back to Earth, or a formation made purely of sand would lose its original shape. A memorial plaque attached to the ladder of the lunar module was dedicated before the return to Earth. Airmen from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. It came in peace for all mankind. A heat shield protects the landing capsule from overheating at temperatures exceeding 4,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The three parachutes open in time, and four days after leaving the moon, the Apollo 11 crew landed in the Pacific Ocean. The recovery of the astronauts took place under strict quarantine procedures. The space travelers looked like aliens from another world. They wore biological isolation suits since there were fears that the astronauts might have brought germs back with them from the moon. Initially, they were transferred to the mobile quarantine facility on board the recovery ship USS Hornet, where their 21 days in quarantine began. Not even their wives were allowed access. The mobile quarantine facility was carried in a military transport aircraft to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. The quarantine continued in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. There, samples from Apollo 11 were examined, including almost 22 kilograms of rock and moon dust. For two weeks, the astronauts were subjected to a series of medical tests and interviews about their experiences on the moon. Parades honoring the astronauts were held in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins won the USA's race against the Soviet Union to stage the first landing on the moon they became indispensable evidence of Western supremacy. The tragedy was that their indispensability meant that they would not experience another space flight. No one was prepared to risk the death of a space hero. The destination of Apollo 12 was the Ocean of Storms, and the start of the trip to the moon was indeed a stormy one for the crew. November 14th, 1969. While the crew was on its way to the launching pad, a violent thunderstorm raged above Cape Kennedy. President Nixon and his entourage didn't suspect that they were about to witness a near catastrophe. In the firing room, over 400 engineers were monitoring the start of the Saturn V. The firing room is part of the Kennedy Space Center complex in Florida. Once the rocket leaves the launching pad, the flight controllers over 1,400 kilometers away in the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas, assume responsibility for the continuation of the flight. There, in the mission control center, they monitor the entire mission around the clock until splashdown. Their radio call sign is Houston. Flight controller John Aaron at Mission Control was responsible for the electrical systems on board Apollo 12. 
During the starting phase, lightning struck the Saturn V twice. Only Aaron was able to interpret the confusing signals on the display correctly. Neither flight director Jerry Griffin at Mission Control, nor the crew of Apollo 12, nor the technicians in the firing room knew the life-saving solution when all the electronics in the spacecraft failed and the mission threatened to abort. 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running, commit. Liftoff, we have liftoff, 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Roger, clear the tower, I got a pick and a roll program and this thing is really going. Roger, Pete. That's a lovely liftoff, that's not bad at all. Roll complete. Roger, Pete. The first lightning strike occurred 36 seconds after launch. Then the second strike. Mark one the firing roll. room was in an uproar. The telemetry data from the Saturn V went mad. And back at mission control, no one knew what had happened. The displays on the monitors were indecipherable. Commander Conrad reported a power failure. Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. Roger. I got three fuel cell lights and AC bus light, fuel cell disconnect, AC bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. John Aaron remembered a simulation which had taken place one year previously, an obscure switch command, SCE to AUX. Apollo 12, Houston, try SCE to auxiliary, over. SCE to auxiliary, what the hell is that? SCE, SCE to auxiliary. Astronaut Alan Bean flicked the switch, which then resulted in the instrument displays onboard Apollo 12 once more being connected to the power system. Ecom reports the readings back. Okay, I have a good GDC, and Al has got the fuel cells back on, and we'll be working on our AC buses. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. Roger, Pete. Roger, Pete. Roger, Pete. Right, Pete, your fuel cells look good down here. We have our problems here. I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm not sure we can get hit by lightning. Apollo 12 reached orbit. I think we need to do a little more all-weather testing. Amen. We have reset all the fuel cells, we have all the buses back on the line, and we'll just square up the platform when we get into orbit. Roger, Pete. That sounds good. Hey, that's one of the better sims, believe me. We've had a couple of cardiac arrests down here, too, Pete. Well, I tell you, I think I forgot it during that boost phase. We ought to talk to you about all that good happening. That's a terrible way to break Albine into spaceflight, I'll tell you. The highlight of Apollo 12 was a precise landing in the ocean of storms, just 163 meters away from the lunar probe Surveyor 3, which had landed on the moon in 1967, two years before the landing of Apollo 12. Commander Charles P. Conrad dismantled parts of Surveyor 3. Later, they would be examined on Earth for remains of terrestrial bacteria, which might have survived the harsh conditions on the moon. The results remain the subject of controversy to this day. Okay, Houston, I'm going to move the TV camera now. The pilot of the lunar module, Alan Bean, carried the television camera to a new location. For a brief moment, the camera tube was exposed to direct sunlight. The camera was destroyed immediately. So from the very start of the extravehicular activity, television broadcasts were no longer possible. The US television stations made do with actors who imitated the actions of the astronauts like marionettes. The sound transmissions were used as stage directions. Look at that rock. It's coming to that rock. Despite the TV camera's failure, the astronauts succeeded in taking fascinating shots of the moon's surface. Designed by Hasselblad, the camera documented a 360-degree pan around the spot where the lunar module Intrepid had landed.
During their return flight to Earth, the crew witnessed a solar eclipse. The difference was that, unlike an eclipse of the sun on Earth, it was not the moon that obscured the sun, but rather the Earth that passed in front of our home star. Apollo 13 is regarded as NASA's most successful failure. Jim Lovell, John Swigert, and Fred Hayes had to fight for their lives. Hey, uh, we've had a problem here. Just say again, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's the way that about. The main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Stand by 13, we're looking at it. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. After almost 56 hours of flight and 300,000 kilometers away from the Earth, oxygen tank number two exploded. The reason was a short circuit in the thermostat. The adjacent oxygen tank number one was also affected. Its contents emptied entirely into space within 130 minutes. The flight controllers calculated that the three fuel cells that were fed with oxygen from the two tanks would only continue to work for a few more hours. The water and power supply to the spacecraft threatened to break down. The Apollo 13 mission had to be aborted. The lunar module Aquarius now became a lifeboat. The problem was that the Aquarius was only designed for two people. The carbon dioxide level in the air rose to a dangerous level. The astronauts risked suffocation. NASA had to improvise. Using items on board like bags, sticky tapes, flight plans, and the commander's sock, they made an adapter for the air purification system. It wasn't possible for the spacecraft to return directly to Earth. The return journey began with a swing-by maneuver around the moon. The temperature in the lunar module sank to 32 degrees Fahrenheit in order to save power. On April 17, 1970, six days after the launch, Apollo 13 swung into orbit around the Earth. The lunar module was separated. It would burn up over the South Pacific Ocean. On board was a radionuclide battery. This nuclear battery was in a protective casing that would survive re-entry intact and that had been specially constructed for just such a situation. To this day, the radionuclide battery containing 3.9 kilograms of plutonium-238 lies at a depth of 6,000 meters on the seabed. The radio silence caused by ionization lasted longer than expected. The cause was that the angle of re-entry was flatter than had been calculated because the scientists forgot to allow for the fact that there was no moon rock on board. This would have increased the weight of the capsule, thereby making the trajectory steeper. Had the astronauts on board burned to death during re-entry, the agonizing radio silence continued. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. should be uh, out of blackout at this time. Uh, we're standing by for any reports of Orion acquisition. Okay, we reached you, Jack. After over four minutes of radio blackout, there were sighs of relief all around. The lives of the three men on board had been saved. Apollo 13 showed how the men at Mission Control and the astronauts on board were able to master an apparently impossible task. New space heroes were born. The landing area of Apollo 14 was the Framoro Highlands, which had originally been the goal of Apollo 13. The lunar module Antares was to be extracted from the third stage of the rocket. The attempts to link up the command module and the lunar module dragged on for over two hours without success. Three times in succession, the docking maneuver failed. Moreover, a peeling layer of paint designed to reduce heating up of the command module by the sun impaired their sight. The reason for the failed attempts at docking lay in the clasps of the docking mechanism. 
After the command module has docked with the lunar module, the clasps are supposed to ensure a stable connection, but the self-locking clasps refused to snap shut. The link-up only succeeded after six docking attempts. The solution was brute force. The reaction control thrusters of the command module provided an extra thrust during the docking with the lunar module. The lunar module Antares separated from the mother ship in lunar orbit and the landing could start. But soon, an unexpected problem occurred. The computer in the lunar module received a signal to abort. If the command abort is received during the descent to the moon's surface, the module automatically begins an emergency ascent back up into orbit. It was the onerous task of computer programmer Donald Ailes to solve the problem. A speck of dust had got caught up in a switch, and it prompted the command abort. Ailes had to reprogram the lunar module so that it would ignore the faulty signal. The software was tested successfully in a simulator in Cape Kennedy. And then another problem occurred. The landing radar was not transmitting any data. Just 5,500 meters above the landing area, the astronauts succeeded in getting the equipment to function again. During their extravehicular activities, the astronauts used an unpowered handcart, the Modular Equipment Transporter, or MET for short. At this point in time, the lunar rover hadn't yet been constructed. The radionuclide battery supplied the central station with power. The central station was the heart of the installation. It distributed power to the measuring equipment and transmitted data back to Earth. Apollo 14 was packed full of experiments. The Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package was an instrument cluster used to conduct long-term lunar experiments. The lifespan of the instruments was generally about one to two years. They primarily measured seismic activities, the composition of the solar wind, the gravitation and the moon's magnetic field. At Mission Control, the data were analyzed by scientists from different fields. On their second day on the moon, Commander Alan Shepard and the pilot of the lunar module, Edgar Mitchell, planned to reach the upper edge of the Cone Moon Crater. Orientation is difficult. In almost four and a half hours, the astronauts only travel about three kilometers. They deviate from their route and lose valuable time. Their oxygen consumption is higher than planned. The astronauts are sweating profusely because they have to drag the heavy met through the deep moon dust. They are running out of time. The oxygen supply from the life support system the astronauts are carrying on their backs is running out. Frustrated, the moon scientists have to abandon their mission of exploration. On the high-resolution picture of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter from 2009, we can see that the astronauts had missed the edge of the Cone Crater by just 30 meters. Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean, who became a successful painter after his active time at NASA, recorded in a painting something that has gone down in the annals of sport, the first game of golf on the moon. For this, Commander Alan Shepard smuggled an iron head of a golf club and two golf balls on board. He used a sample extraction tool as a shaft. Try the dive, one more. Apollo 15 was a mission with a main focus on geology. For Commander Scott, it was the third space flight after Gemini 8 and Apollo 9. The landing area was the Hadley Rill in the Apennine Mountains of the Moon, one of the highest lunar ranges. On July 30th, 1971, the lunar module Falcon headed towards the curve of the Hadley Rill, the so-called Elbow. In spite of the mountainous terrain, the lunar module lands safely on the Moon's surface.
The astronauts gazed down into the 370 meter deep Hadley Gorge. Extinct lava flows and collapsed lava veins formed a fantastic landscape. The panorama photo shows the overwhelming Hadley Massif, which is 4.6 kilometers high and 25 kilometers wide. The astronauts were able to use the lunar rover for the first time. In spite of the defective front steering, the vehicle, which could travel at up to 12 kilometers per hour, proved ideal for lunar exploration across greater distances. Thanks to the lunar vehicle and improved spacesuits, the astronauts were able to spend a total of over 18 hours outside the lunar module and collect some 77 kilograms of lunar rock. Among the astronauts' tasks was also the franking of stamps in the vacuum of the moon. This marked the start of the stamp affair of Apollo 15. In addition to the approved envelopes, the astronauts also took envelopes that had not been approved with them on board, which they then sold to a German collector for a considerable sum of money. When NASA learned later what had happened, a formal investigation against the Apollo 15 crew was initiated. NASA reprimanded the astronauts, and this marked the end of the active space careers of Scott, Warden, and Irwin. First day of issue. What could be a better place to cancel the stamp than right here? It's Hadley Real. After franking the stamps, Commander Scott aimed to prove before a live camera that the law of falling bodies also applied on the moon. He proposed dropping a hammer and a feather at the same time. Despite their different weights, both objects should hit the ground at the same time because there was no air resistance in the vacuum prevailing on the moon. Would Galileo Galilei's law of falling bodies be equally valid on the moon? Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. And the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. In honor of the astronauts and cosmonauts who had died during the exploration of space, Scott placed a statuette, the fallen astronaut, on the moon's surface. The names of the members of the Apollo 1 crew were also listed on the aluminum plaque. On a cold January day in 1967, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee had been on their way to a routine exercise. It was known as a plugs out test and involved the cutting off of all connections between the rocket and the spacecraft and the service center. The test was considered quite safe. Neither the fire brigade nor the tower team for the capsule were in attendance. As he climbed into the capsule, Grissom noticed an unpleasant smell of sour milk. 
the radio contact kept cutting out. Then, a fire broke out, fed by the pure oxygen in the command capsule. The exit hatch could not be opened because the pressure inside was too high. 30 seconds after the fire broke out, the astronauts had suffocated. Their bodies became fused with the nylon suits and seats. The accident was a grave setback for the Apollo program, which was still in its infancy. Numerous changes were made to the Apollo modules and the spacesuits. The exit hatch could be opened in an emergency even when the pressure inside was much higher. The cables and insulation materials were made fireproof. The atmosphere on board was replaced by an oxygen-nitrogen mixture in the starting phase. It was not until over one and a half years later that the first manned Apollo spaceflight could take place, Apollo 7. Before returning to Earth, Apollo 15 released a sub-satellite to measure the gravity and magnetic fields. The sub-satellite discovered a magnetism anomaly around the Reiner Gamma region. The magnetic field is strong enough to deflect the solar wind. There was a moment of anxiety during splashdown. One of the braking parachutes failed to open. Two parachutes were just adequate to ensure a safe landing. The goals of Apollo 16 were the lunar highlands and the rocky material thought to be there from the earliest days of the moon's existence. While the lunar module Orion was located on the backside of the moon, the main propulsion unit of the Apollo spacecraft was to be ignited. But the reserve system gave rise to uncontrollable vibrations. According to the rules of the mission, the pilot of the command module, Thomas Mattingly, did not carry out the ignition. The spacecraft was thus unable to swing into an orbit around the moon. Together, the flight controllers at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Texas, the mathematicians at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the engineers at North American Rockwell in South California were able to isolate the problem. This was followed by simulations that soon paid off. As soon as the main propulsion unit was switched on, the vibrations of the reserve propulsion unit were no longer dangerous. Commander John Young and Lunar Module Pilot Charles Duke landed in the Descartes Highlands, just six hours behind schedule. That's a pretty outstanding picture here, I tell you. Come on, a little bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, oh. There we go. This. NASA used a spectrograph for the distant ultraviolet light. The camera had to be kept cool and was therefore positioned in the shadow of the lunar module. The astronauts aimed at the astronomical targets by hand. Okay. Thus, the camera showed the Earth's geocorona, which is made of hydrogen and which extends across up to 15 and a half times the Earth's radius. Multiple lighting makes the Earth's polar lights, its sunlit atmosphere, and the stars in the background clearly visible. The moon travelers undertake a number of excursions. They travel a total of over 26 kilometers with the lunar rover. The intensive geological training on the Earth pays off on the moon. Over 96 kilograms of rock and soil samples are carried back to Earth. Okay. Go 
real travel, isn't it? Now you found a real rock. <laughs> Look at that thief kill. Let me get it, John. That is a very travel rock, and it's the most shock rock I've ever seen. It's just pure white. <laughs> ah. Good show. Up. Okay. We see that one went all the way in. Not quite. <laughs> the heat flow experiment is designed to measure tectonic and volcanic activity on the moon. An unfortunate error by Commander Young makes this the biggest disappointment on the Apollo 16 mission. The probe is out of the ground up to B-8. Right, in between, right on the line between B-7 and B-8. Okay, Baker, 7 and 8. You copy, Clyde. Roger. Charlie, 1, 2, 3. The simulated attempts at repairs on Earth turn out to be too time-consuming. The heat flow experiment can no longer be carried out. During the return to Earth, at a distance of 310,000 kilometers from his home planet, the pilot of the command module undertakes a spacewalk for almost an hour and a half. He retrieves film cassettes from the scientific instrument module. At the beginning of December 1972, Apollo 17 set off for the moon. For the first time, there is a scientist on board, the geologist Harrison Schmidt. It is the first night launch for the Saturn V, and at the same time, the last mission of the Apollo moon landing program. took the first picture of the entire Earth. The picture of the blue marble was possible because the launch took place shortly after the new moon. The crew of Apollo 17 broke a number of records. Their mission lasted for over 12 days. The astronauts spent almost 23 hours on missions outside the spacecraft, and they brought over 110 kilograms of rock samples back to Earth. They landed in the Taurus Littro Valley on the southeastern part of the Sea of Serenity. The Mare Serenitatis was formed some 3.9 billion years ago following the impact of a massive celestial body.
A talent for improvisation was called for when the right rear wing of the lunar rover broke off. With the help of adhesive tape, staples, and a lunar map, the damage to the vehicle was repaired. Without the wheel cover, moon dust flew around the pilots, and it became impossible to drive by sight. The powder-like moon dust presented a huge problem. It was as rough as sandpaper and crept into the connecting elements of the spacesuits, making them extremely difficult to close so that they were airtight. It therefore became essential for survival that the fine powder was carefully brushed off before clamoring back into oh, the lunar module. Ah, oh, thank you, Dino. It looks much better. The television camera also needed constant cleaning. The fine powder caused the spacesuits to become statically loaded. Inside the lunar module, the moon dust smelled like burnt gunpowder because it reacted with the oxygen present there. The space travelers in Apollo 17 had finally become mine workers. Orange-colored glass beads were scattered around the 110-meter crater known as Shorty. The glass fragments are 3.64 billion years old and are the remains of a volcanic eruption. For the geologist Schmidt, the discovery was the find of a lifetime. Oh, hey! Wait a minute. But here are the reflections. I've been fooling. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. Hey, it is. I can see it from here. It's orange. Where well, I put my visor up? It's still orange. Sure it is. Crazy. Orange. An improvised variation on the song The Fountain in the Park made the Apollo 17 astronauts Cernan and Schmidt a world-famous singing duo. Ba, ba, ba. I was strolling on the moon one day In, in a merry, merry month of December oh, May, May, May is the month May, that's year. right. <laughs> May is the year of the month. When they're much to my surprise A pair of bunny eyes Shortly before a lunar module took off for the last time from the moon, the astronauts left behind a memorial plaque with a message of peace for all mankind. The words are here man completed his first exploration of the moon, December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. This is our commemoration that will be here until someone like us, until some of you all out there who are the promise of the future, come back to read it again and to further the exploration and the meaning of Apollo. 99, proceeded, three, two, one, ignition. Run right away, Houston. Good. The departure of the astronauts Cernan and Schmidt on December 14, 1972, marked the end of the Apollo missions to the moon. Since then, no human beings have returned to the moon. Challenger, Houston, would like to terminate now. Between 1969 and 1972, 12 space travelers set foot on the moon's surface. The pioneering deeds of the Apollo astronauts continue to inspire us right up to this day.